we're continuing our studies in the um, in the book of Mark. Just bear with me. Um, we're still in Mark chapter thirteen. We're still in Mark chapter thirteen, and, and the last time we were looking, we've been looking in these verses for quite for quite some time, and we were looking at the reflection that would be coming. The reflection that would come, and we saw that that it was God who had created all things. It was in God who was in control of all things. I know the last time we saw that there was things that we had to create. There was things that we had to create in our Christian lives or to, to, to serve God and to be faithful to God. And we saw that we, done, we had an acrostic in the word create. And we saw there was a, the C was for confidence. I know you can be confident. You can be confident that you've spelt the word, the word create properly for the, the acrostic to find that you've missed out the E. And again, we see that while we can have a confidence, many people in this world are confident confident that they know the answer, confident there is no God, confident that they are, that the life that they're living is okay, that there'll be no God and there'll be no judgment, and they're confident of that, they're confident that everything's going to be okay, they don't need to repent, they don't need any of these things, but we see that the gospel is very clear, the gospel is very clear that we must repent, you know, when we see that that's important, you know, no matter whether you attend church, whether you're in this Zoom meeting, you know, if you don't know the Lord, you need to repent, and we see that that was the important thing, and that was the, the refuge, the city of refuge was there for people to repent, to get to this place. And we saw that, you know, if you're unconverted, you needed to get to the city of refuge. And perhaps two weeks have passed now since that message has been preached, and you still haven't got to the city of refuge. You're still in that place where the, the avenger of blood can come for you, and you must, you must, and we'll see in, in one of the points tonight, how important it is not to think that you will always have another opportunity, not to think that there'll be another time. You know, we saw that as Christians, the E was to express, to express and to create this expression of worship to God. The E was to create an attitude of faith. And we thank God for the, the faith that we've seen in our meetings, in our prayer times. And we, we thank God for the answers that have increased our faith. We've seen so many, Gary mentioned them this morning, of people who have we've prayed for, in absolutely hopeless situations, yet God has, has made a way, and that increases our faith. And then we did see the tea was for time, and we saw how important that time is. The time is so important to get right with God, and then the E, well, the E just wasn't there. So that was that was last week, but it brings us to where we are tonight, and that's in Mark chapter 13 and verse 20. And again, still on this, this whole theme of, of, of the end times and of judgment on difficult, of difficult days, and in verse 20, it reads, And except the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened the days. And here we see that the Lord, in those days, in those days of difficulty, in those days of trial, would shorten the days for his people. And we see that, brothers and sisters, that today we can be in a very difficult place. We can be in a place of, of trials and of troubles. And we can perhaps... Perhaps it was maybe even touch and go that we would join the meeting tonight. Such was the difficulties that we're in. Perhaps we, we've, we've felt we've had a very hard week. Perhaps we've felt we've had a very hard day. Perhaps it's not just been a hard week. You might be saying it's been a hard year. And perhaps we've felt so difficult that times are just crushing in upon us. Problems have crushed in our problems. It can be health problems. It can be to do with the, the, shut, the lockdown, it can be do with financially, with our families. There can be many reasons why we feel like that. But you know, this verse shows us that we're not alone, that God knows exactly where we are in this moment. As our brother Gary says, God knows all things. And God knows the thoughts of your heart. You know, we can come on to this meeting and we can come on and we can say that we're okay. We can say that everything's good. But in our hearts, there's anxiety, there's fear. There's worries. God knows. God knows what, what other people don't know. And we see that God cares. Because as we see in this verse, that God would shorten the days for his people. And you know, the Lord will never let us go through anything that we can't handle. The Lord will never leave us in a situation beyond we're capable of. And at times we might think, well, Lord, I'm at that place. I've been at that place for quite some time now. Why haven't you come and, and shortened the days? You know, we see that God also has a plan and a purpose for our lives. God has a purpose and in, in, in all that all things work together for good. And we're going to look, we're going to look just at a, a small portion of the life of Joseph. You know, Joseph was somebody who knew troubles. 
Joseph was somebody who knew difficulties. He also knew the blessing of God in his life. He also knew that God had promised him great things. But in his life, there were times when these promises looked as if they were never going to happen. They looked as if the opportunity for these things to happen was gone. But we see how Joseph trusted God. And as we see just taking this, how God would shorten the days, we're going to look at four things. We're going to look at the shortfall. We're going to look at short-sighted. We're going to look at shortcomings. And finally, shortcuts. So as we come to this point of, of shortfall, you know, as I say, for Joseph, we would see that his life was, was tremendously difficult. You know, as I said, God had blessed him. God had greatly blessed him. God had promised him, had given him beautiful dreams. He was greatly loved by his father, but we see that he was hated by his brothers. And we would know the story. He was sold by his brothers. He found himself as a slave in Egypt. He found himself in prison in Egypt. And, you know, sometimes when we look at Joseph's life, we forget, you know, we see him as the prime minister and doing great things for God, but we forget that he was a prisoner. And sometimes we look and we see God's people who did great things in the midst of great difficulties, and we think, ah, but that was Joseph. That was Moses. That was Samuel. That was David. But, you know, God was with them. And we see that God is with us, brothers and sisters, and God loves us and God cares for us. And that we can do great things for God. Because as I say, Joseph was just a prisoner. But God had a plan for his life. And you might feel like a prisoner right now. Perhaps you haven't been out of the house for quite some time. Perhaps there's other things that make you feel that you're imprisoned in your situation. That this situation is something that there is no end to. Yet God is with you. And God loves you and God cares for you. And God will bring you through these things. You know, one thing that was that was evident in the life of Joseph was that Joseph had such a good attitude in all of the difficulties he faced. You know, you meet some people and they never take responsibility for things that go wrong. They blame others. They're always blaming other people for, for things that happen in their life. They never take the responsibility that maybe it's them. It's always someone else's fault. The situation is always someone else's fault. They complain about everything. They're, they're always complaining about the circumstances. They're always complaining about the situation. And they're never grateful. They're never grateful. No matter what happens, they're never thankful. And, you know, Joseph was the exact opposite of, of these things. You know, Joseph had people to blame. Joseph could have looked at his brothers and said, Bro my brothers have put me in. This has all become because of my brothers. He could, have come, he could have looked and blamed Potiphar's wife. But we never read of Joseph blaming anyone, but he trusted God. He never complained in his situation either. You know, and his situation was grim. You know, to be sold, to be sold as a slave. You know, we, we hear today, and it has been for such a long time, of people trafficking. That's exactly what was happening to Joseph. He was sold into a foreign land and to be a slave in a foreign land. And then in the prison, we see that he never complained. He never complained to God. He never said to God, why has this happened to me? You know, and we see that he was grateful in every situation. You know, and that's why he, he had favour with the guards. He found favour wherever he was. And, you know, that's not just something that is a Christian thing. That's something that happens in, in every act of anybody's life. You know, if you are somebody who, as I said, blames others, complains, is never grateful, you'll struggle in life. People, people won't want to be with you. They'll think, that person's just hard work. Whereas if you meet somebody who is thankful, somebody who is who who looks for the best in situations, who's positive, then people tend to 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 be light more and go on more. Why? It's just because that's it's a, a positive outlook on things. And we see that Joseph certainly had a positive outlook. And we know that that was because God was with him, but we see that some but God is with us. And that we need to see in our situations, as our brother Gary spoke this morning that we must trust God. We must bring our problems to God and know that God cares and know that God is with us and, and leave them with God. And that can be the hardest part because we, we want to take them back. We, we, we do worry, we are, we can't be anxious. And at times like Joseph, there's much to be anxious about, but we see that we must trust God. We must believe that God is, is there for us and that God is with us. And we must also see that in, in this situation, that God has a plan. We must believe that God has a plan for our lives, that God has a purpose. And even where we may find ourselves right now, there is a purpose. 
God has a purpose, and it may be a purpose that we can't see right now, but we must believe that God is with us, that God will bring us through this. This too shall pass. You know, that is where we see Joseph. We know Joseph was in the prison, and Potiphar had the dream. He had the dream of the, 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 the fat cows and the thin cows, and we know the story that, that Joseph would interpret the dream. God would give him the revelation of the dream. There would be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of, of famine. And we see there would be a tremendous shortfall in the land of Egypt, a tremendous shortfall of food. But you see that Joseph was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, when you read the story of Joseph, because we know how the story ends, we know, well, that's exactly, Joseph had to be in the prison because he had to meet the butler and the baker and they would, it would be the right time that they would remember and then Joseph would be brought out. But let's remember that Joseph was living that. Joseph didn't know at that point how the story ended. He just knew he was in prison. He just knew that the butler had forgotten him. He just knew that he was still in the prison. But he still trusted God and he still believed God in that situation. And we need to see, brothers and sisters, that in our situation, it may be difficult right now, but it can be exactly where God wants us to be for the purposes of God. And we see that would happen. Joseph would be brought from that prison. And Joseph would tell Pharaoh exactly what the dream would mean, exactly what was about to happen. Not only what was happening, but what they should do. That what they needed to do to come through the years of plenty and be prepared for the years of famine. And we see how important that was. And that was the difference. That made the difference. The words of Joseph made the difference. And we see that we see that we too need in these times, in these difficult times, to be men and women who know God, to be men and women who know what God would have us to do, what we must do in the, in the famine, what we must do in the difficult times, to listen to the voice of God, to listen to God and to trust God. You know, that this you get this, you don't need to turn it up, but it's in Genesis chapter 41 is the story of where Joseph comes to Pharaoh and tells him of the dreams and tells him what they mean. And we see in Joseph someone who knew God and who knew the mind of God. And we must, in the midst of our circumstances, whatever they may be tonight, we must know God's mind and we must know God's heart and we must listen to God. Because we see that we, we are in a time where there's, where there's much information. We're told, you know, we listen to the, our politicians, our first minister, the prime minister, come on and tell us about what has to happen in the virus, what's happening with the situation in our nation. We listen to the experts on health who tell us things. We hear things about what other countries are doing and this is happening. And on top of that, we hear other things, other, other thoughts and other ideas of what is exactly going on. And we see the importance of, of listening to God. We see the importance of, of taking that information but coming to God and asking God, what must we do? What do you tell us to do? What are we to do in this situation? It's easy to listen to so many different things. But, you know, we need to be people men and women and young people who listen to God. And in every situation in our life, to look to God for every decision we must make to know this is God's will, that God is with me and trust God in all of these things because we see in the second point of short-sighted. We see that at times we can become short-sighted when things are difficult. When things are, are hard, it can be very easy to look just at where we are and what's going on. And we can find all of the problems overwhelming. We can find the circumstances so difficult and we can't see a future. We can't see an end. We can't see ourselves getting out of this, out of this situation. Yet, if we would only remember God's promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That the Lord has went to prepare a place for us, that God loves us, that, he's, that he cares for us and he's with us and he knows everything that we go through. But sometimes in the midst of the problems, in the midst of the difficulties, we can forget these things. In the midst of the storm, all we can see like the disciples is the wind and the waves, the boat filling with water. When really we need to see the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us and the Lord, the Lord fights for us. And brothers and sisters, we see that very often it's, it's, it's easy, and we have all been there, where we just look at where we are, and we look, and we can't see any further. We can't see a way out. We can't see that this will pass. We can't see that God's blessing will return. 
We can only see the difficulties that we're in at the moment. We only see, we don't see the big, we don't see the bigger picture. We don't see God's plan. We don't see God's purposes. We don't have the vision. Now we're just looking at where we are in the moment. And we see that very often that can happen. You know, we see, as we've seen in the story of the prodigal, he lived for that moment. When he got the inheritance, his, his aim was to spend that money and enjoy that money. He never looked any further ahead that this might run out, that this might, this might be a mistake to leave the father's house. He wanted to leave. You know, we see at times people who perhaps been brought in Christian homes, perhaps been in the house of God for a long time, but in a moment they decide, I'm leaving this. I'm leaving this behind. I want to live my life away from the restrictions, as they see, of, of God's word and the things of God. I want to do my own thing. You know, they forget and they don't see the bigger picture. They don't see God's plan for their life. They only see what they want to do in that moment. And they find themselves like the prodigal. They find themselves like the prodigal. No doubt he enjoyed himself. No doubt he enjoyed, he enjoyed the money, he enjoyed the life he lived. But it was short-lived. It was just for a moment. I know we see that for so many people, they are living in this moment. They're living for right now. They're not thinking of their eternal soul. They're not thinking that there will be a judge of that judgment day that we heard of on Friday. They're living for now, and they're enjoying now. And listen, we've said, I've said it many times, we can't live in the past and we can't live in the future. We can only live today. But that doesn't mean that we can't be prepared for tomorrow, that we don't have plans for tomorrow. And that doesn't mean that, that if you're unconverted tonight, that you can think that you will always have a tomorrow. There will always be another meeting. There will always be another time to hear the gospel. And for so many people, they live in this moment. They live in the life that they live. That they will, you know, People know they won't live forever but they don't expect to die. They don't expect to die tomorrow. They don't expect to die next week. They expect to be here forever. But the reality is that we will, none of us will live forever. Unless the Lord comes back, we will all die. And we see that many people just live, like saying to themselves, if there's a God, I'll deal with that another time. Another time, and there'll be, a, there'll be another time. There'll be another time to get right with God. There'll be another time to hear the gospel. Yet that time will run out. And that's why it is so important. If you're unconverted tonight, maybe you've heard the message so many times. You've heard the gospel so many times. Perhaps you've thought, well, I'll get right with God one day. One day I'll, I'll, I'll seriously consider these things. One day, that one day will never come unless you, unless you get to God, unless you repent and get right with God. And, you know, we see that even as Christians, we can, we can sometimes be short-sighted in the plans of God and what God has for our lives. And that's why sin, sin can come into our lives. All we can see is the moment. You know, we see that with David when he sinned with Bathsheba. All David could see was that moment. You know, if David could have stopped, if David could have looked ahead and saw that there would be consequences and the repercussions of what he was about to do, he would never have done them. But, you know, very often that's the problem with sin. We're caught in the moment. We're caught up with what we want to do. The decisions we want to make, not God's will, not what God would have us to do, but what we want to do in that moment. That's the thing we want. And then we find ourselves with the consequences. We find ourselves in the repercussions of our actions. And we find that we should have, if only we had looked further ahead, if only we'd kept our eyes upon the Lord, if we hadn't just looked at the thing we wanted to do, we see that God, that this would, we could have avoided all of the, the problems on all of the difficulties. And you know, we see... We see that the answer is the Lord. The answer is the Lord to all of our situations. And as even as Christians, we can we can sometimes forget that. We can sometimes forget what God would have us to do. We can sometimes forget that God's promises. We sometimes just see what the circumstances and the situation and forget that God is that God is with us. You know, we can forget God's promises, and that's why at times people give up on God's promises. You know, there was another famine, and that was the famine in Samaria. And remember, we remember in that story how. You know, the prophet said, by this time tomorrow, that fine flour would be sold and all of the, all this thing would be happening. And, and the kings, the man, the servant of the king said, if God would make windows in heaven, might that thing be? You know, he couldn't see that God could do this. He couldn't see that this was possible. Yet by the very next day, all that the prophet said had come to pass. And you know, sometimes we can give up just before the answer comes. 
we can say, I've waited so long. God hasn't shortened the time. The promises haven't come. God told me this would happen. God said this was going to happen. God said we'd have this. God promised me this was going to happen. I can't wait any longer. I'm giving it up. And perhaps some have given it up just before the answer was about to happen. You know, what if Joseph in that prison had said, I've had enough of this. God's promised me all of these things. And they came to him and said, Pharaoh said a dream. And Joseph said, don't tell me about dreams. Dreams have been the problem in my life. I've, had, don't, I've answered dreams. I've had dreams. I don't want to know about Pharaoh's dream. I'm just going to stay here. Dreams only bring me problems. You know, he would have missed that. He wouldn't have been where he needed to be. I know we see brothers and sisters that God could be saying to us now, hold on, hold on to the promise. Even although it seems impossible, even although it seems in the situation right now that what God has said is never going to happen, look, look to the future, look with faith to see what God has said, because what God has said will surely, will surely come to pass. And then we see the shortcomings. You know, the famine in Egypt wasn't just in Egypt, but was in, in all the world. And we know that, that, that Jacob would send his sons to Egypt to, to meet this, this man who had the answer, to meet this man who had the food. And the brothers would go, the brothers would go to Egypt and wouldn't know that the man that stood before them was their brother Joseph. But we see that in their conversation as he asked them about their family, as he asked them about their father and, their, and, and if there was any other brothers we see that in Genesis chapter 42. We see that this brought them to realize their shortcomings. This brought them to remember what they had done. And we see that in Genesis chapter 40, 42 and verse 21. <coughs> Excuse me. Then they said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother. And that we saw the anguish of soul. When he besought us, we would not hear therefore as this distress come upon us? And Reuben answered them, saying, Speak I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore, behold, also this blood is required. You know, I don't know how they had lived. I don't know how they had lived with themselves from that moment. They had, they had obviously sold their brother. They had lied to their father. And perhaps, perhaps they had told themselves, Listen, it's done. There's worse people in the world than us. There's worse people. Where people have done worse things than us. We never killed them. You know, we just have to go on our life. We're not perfect, but, you know, we're not that bad. And for so many people in this world, that's how they live their lives. You know, they hear about sin and they hear about repentance and they think, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. Deep down, I'm a good person. I do good. I do good to my fellow man. I help people where I can. I live a good life. You know, I would never, you know, and no matter, no matter whoever you meet, they will always know somebody worse than them. They'll always look to somebody who's worse than them. They'll look to people who go to prison. And then people in prison will look at people who have done worse things in prison. And we can always justify ourselves. We can always find some another reason why we're not that bad. You know, we can do things that are wrong and say, oh, it's not that bad. There's People are doing this, people are doing that. And, you know, we see that that's the problem. Unless we realize our shortcomings, unless we realize that, and as you're unconverted tonight, unless you realize that you are coming short, because the word of God says that we have all come short of the glory of God. God is a standard, and a standard that none of us have attained, a standard that none of us would even have even come close to, and that's because we're sinners, and we will never come close to that. And that is why if you are unconverted tonight, you need to realize you need to realize that you're going to come short. You're going to come short to the things of God and to God's standard. And that is why, that's why there's a hell. And that's why people are in hell, because they've come short. And that's why you need to repent. And again, until you come to that place, until you come to the place where you realize that you are a sinner, where you realize that no matter how good you think you are, it will never be enough. It will never be enough. Until you realize you need to repent, you need to come to the Lord Jesus. That's why he died on the cross. You need to come and repent of your sins. Then there will be never, you will never come to serve. So many people are religious and are self-righteous. You know, they go to church and they think, well, 
I go to church and I believe in God and, and I and I you know I like I like the things of I read the Bible and I like all of the things that's associated with that. God will look in these things. Yet all the times the life has never been changed. You know, the same is true for the backslider. You know, the backslider perhaps can look and say, well, you know what? I'm not what I should be, but you know, there's um, at least I've, I've, I've put my trust in God. But you know, we see that there's a big difference between somebody who is a backslider and somebody that's a false professor. And you know, if you tonight have made a profession, but your life isn't been lived for God, if your life, if you don't have a desire for the things of God, if you don't have a desire for prayer, for the house of God, for the word of God, then you need to question: Have you really been saved? You need to look and see, is there shortcomings in my life? Am I living the life that, that God expects me to live? Or am I living a life that I just think's enough? And we need, to, we need to all look at that. Because even, even as children of God, even as God's people, there's things that we know that we should do, but we don't do. I mean, we can always find a reason why we haven't done them, always find a reason why we will do them. But even as God's people, we see that there's things God, God wants, us, wants for us and that we could have if only we would we would we would take that step we would take that step on and we're going to just look at, at someone in Mark in Luke chapter nineteen in Luke nineteen we see somebody who had who was short in more ways than one and in Luke nineteen you see this we see the story of a man called Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus was Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he came to see the Lord. I get not look particularly at the verses, but it's in Luke chapter 19, and we see that Zacchaeus was um, in verse 3, and he sought to see Jesus, who he, who he was, but he could not for the press because he was little of stature. He was short. I know he couldn't see. He, was too, he couldn't see over the crowd. But so what do we see? What do we see that he did? He made hate. Ah, here we go. In verse 4, and he ran before them and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. You know, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but because of the crowd, he couldn't see. But, you know, he was prepared to run ahead. He was prepared to make the effort to get ahead, to climb a tree. You know, he was a tax collector. I mean, he was hated by everybody, but he was in a position of authority. Yet here he was climbing this tree because he knew he had to see Jesus. He knew that he needed to see Jesus. And as Jesus would come, Jesus would stop and would call him down and would, would come, would, co- would say, I need to come to your house. And his life was changed. And we see today that we can put up all the, the excuses of why we, we can't, you know, we might say, well, we're in lockdown right now. We can't get to the church. This, if this thing was different, if that thing was different, if only such circumstances were different, I could do this or I could do that. You know, we see, we need to see is our desires. If we have the desire for it, then we will find a way. If we have the desire for it, then we will make a way. You know, just as Zacchaeus did, he ran ahead, he climbed a tree, and he found Jesus. And, you know, we can put all the reasons why things won't work out or why this isn't happening in our lives. Sometimes we need to see it's, it's our shortcomings and we need to overcome them and we need to be determined to push, to push ourselves beyond perhaps what we would normally do to get to God, to get closer to God, to live this life that God would have us to live. And then finally, the last point is the shortcut. You know, everybody loves a shortcut. You know, maybe you've been making a journey and you make that journey all the time and then somebody says, do you know, do you know this way? And all of a sudden you think, wow, this is, I wish I had known, this is fantastic. This has cut such a, a long, a long bit out of my journey. You know, sometimes some people tell you a shortcut and you think, this is a long way for a shortcut. Um, but, but again, shortcuts are good. It's the same, some people, some people in the midst of a story will say, they cut a long story short, and you think, if this is the long story cut short, how long was the story? Because you've been on for ages. But we see that there are shortcuts in life, and some shortcuts are good, and some shortcuts, some shortcuts lead us down a, de- and, and, uh, a dead end. But, you know, we see here, in our, in our verse tonight in, in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 13 and 20, that, that God would cut short the days for his people. In the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the trial, we see that except the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh should be saved. What a difficult day that is. But for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, he had shortened the days. God would cut that day short for his people. I know 
if we are God's people tonight, then we need to rejoice. We need to rejoice that we are the elect tonight. And we're only the elect because when Jesus would go to the cross on the worst day there has ever been, that day wasn't cut short. There was no shortcuts for Jesus. There was no outs for Jesus. It would have to be the cross. It would have to be the crucifixion. It would have to be death. He would have to take our sins. He never had a shortcut. That day was never cut short. There was no ram caught in the thicket for Jesus. There was no other way. It was a cross. It was our sins that were laid upon him. And, you know, we thank God tonight that he never looked for a shortcut, that he never took a shortcut, that he never thought, let's find another way, but that he went all the way, that we might be the elect, that we might be saved, that we might know this night that in our difficulties, in our trials, and in the difficult parts of our life, that God will come and shorten the time for us, that God will be with us because of what the Lord done for us. And that's something for us to rejoice in, think, that, that he went through all of that, all of the suffering, all of the pain, all of our sins he took, that we might be forgiven. And tonight we are forgiven, and that we rejoice. And that because we are forgiven, and because he went to the cross, we see there's no shortcut to heaven. There's no shortcuts. The only way is to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. John 14 and 6 tells us that Jesus is the only way. You know, as I say, many people think there's shortcuts to heaven to live a good life. To live, live a good life, and you'll get to heaven. Be a good person. You know, listen to what the Pope tells you. Do the things, do these things, and you'll get to heaven. False shepherds tell people, oh, you've, they've lived a good life. They're in heaven now. There's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. There's only one way, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him this night. If you're unconverted, come to him. Repent of your sins, and your life can be changed. For those of us that are Christians tonight, we can rejoice that we came, that we can rejoice this night, that we have come and know that this is true, that Jesus loves us, that we are the elect that Jesus has spoken of, whom he had chosen. He chose us. He chose us to be his people, and he loves us. And we can rejoice that no matter the circumstances we face, that God is always with us. Amen.